I'm ready. So I'd like to uh, welcome you all to today's webinar. And the topic is working with individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities and sexual behavior problems by Robin Wilson. And uh, before we, uh, I introduce Robin, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Neary Press. And uh, our mission at Neary Press is to share cutting edge research and best practices emerging in our field. And I say our field because all of us here are professionals who work uh, in the field with, with you. And it's really important to us as we offer you these uh, webinars and other knowledge uh, features that I'll talk about in a second, if we have some input and feedback from you. So I, we really appreciate your suggestions for topics, things that worked on the webinar or didn't, um, and we love to hear from you. So please don't be shy. We, we love the feedback, good, bad, or uh, ugly. So um, a little bit more about Neary Press. For many years, we were only a book publisher, but with changes in the publishing world, we're exploring now what it means to maintain our mission, but move towards a broader definition of our work is really as a knowledge dissemination entity. And in the last five years with that goal, we've begun to offer online courses, newsletters, and now most recently these webinars by some of our internationally recognized authors. At the end of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about uh, this issue again, but if you find these webinars helpful, we hope you'll consider becoming a sponsor of this series. So it's a little bit like National Public Radio. Uh, it's your donations that help make this series happen. And like NPR, we also offer you a free gift of two of our books, Current Perspectives and Current Applications. So truly this kind of support allows us to can continue to bring you these free, uh, free resources. So let me take a moment to introduce our speaker and I'm really delighted and thrilled to, uh, to do so. Uh, because I've had the pleasure of, of working with Robin for a long time and I've learned a great deal from him. Robin is a PhD, a doctorate and an APBP. Uh, he's a researcher, educator and board certified clinical psychologist who's worked with sexual and other offenders for more than 27 years. He's president of the Florida Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers and is the elected Southern Regional Representative on the board of ATSA. Uh, Dr. Wilson is presently the editor of the ATSA Forum and uh, administering the blog spot. Um, as with uh, all workshops, I want to tell you what our learning objectives are today. First of all, we want to review perspectives on assessment and management. Second, to learn the challenges of adapting evidence-based practices to special needs populations. Third, to compare and contrast methods used in working with people with and without intellectual uh, di disabilities and problem sexual behaviors. And finally, review opportunities for healthy uh, sexual behavior. Uh, also let you know that uh, we will be posting this PowerPoint on the Neary Press website shortly after the presentation. And we'll be posting a recording of the webinar sometime next week. Couple instructions for all of you who are listening. When the workshops are over, please be sure to close out your account because we'll be sending you an evaluation. And again, we truly would love your feedback uh, if you would take the moment to do it. And um, fourth, uh, for those of you who are interested, and some of you may be, we're now offering CE credits for these webinars at a very nominal cost. And if you're interested, go to the website for Neary Press for more information. Finally, after about a week, we'll send you a follow-up email that has a link to the recordings and a link to the certificate of completions. And last, before I turn this over to Robin, I wanna highlight uh, the book that Robin has produced, which is Intellectual Disabilities and Problems in Sexual Behavior. Based upon years of work in Canada, in fact, the royalties of this book go back to the dynamic program Robin created there. I could say a lot more about it, but I think all of you want to be hearing directly from one of the authors. So Dr. Robin Wilson, welcome. And it's, I'm very glad to be turning this over to you. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for that. 
going to uh, get myself up here, show my screen, okay, and share my webcam. So there I hope you can all see me uh, sitting in my office in my home in Sarasota, Florida. Um, before I get started, just a couple of things. First of all, sorry to Steve, obviously I didn't update my bio with you. Um, most of the nice things you said to me are things that I used to be. So I'm no longer the president of FATSA. I'm now the, uh, post, the past president. And I recently cycled off the board of ATSA and uh, also passed on the duties for the forum and the blog to others as well. I found myself uh, saddled with some uh, very time consuming stuff this year and had to find a way to make some space. Um, other than that, the only, the only other thing I would say is that I, I certainly wouldn't say that I created the program in Canada, although I certainly have had a hand in little bits and pieces of it. Um, those, those bits of credit uh, belong to other people. So this, uh, this afternoon, what I'd like to talk about with you is uh, working with people with intellectual disabilities and problems in sexual behavior. Um, and this is, of course, the title of the book that Steve just referred to. See if I can get my stuff to go. Why is that not working? Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the book. Um, and again, as Steve said, this is not necessarily shameless self-promotion and that I don't actually get any money from this my, uh, myself. All of the, uh, okay. All of the royalties for this uh, go back into the program that we continue to run up in, in, in essentially Toronto, Canada. So within the context of, of, of this webinar, what we're talking about is really a kind of expanded uh, intellectual disability. And I guess uh, for the most part, we're talking about people who have any impaired cognitive ability. So we're talking about some brain injury folks, folks that have some autism spectrum issues, fetal alcohol stuff, intellectual you know, development disorder, um, and, you know, as I said, other things that would interfere with their ability to think and learn and express themselves um, as, as others uh, do. Some of the difficulties that they face, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but the problems in being able to express themselves, as I said, and it's not just in terms of what they say to others, but also in terms of being able to understand what people say to them. There are a lot of, uh, of sort of practical issues that many folks with ID face in terms of just being able to do things that most of us take for granted, like, like look after ourselves, uh, make friends, negotiate friendly relationships, being able to make decisions for, for themselves, um, being uh, you know, sort of safe and uh, being able to look after one's health care. And of course, um, the focus of what we're gonna talk about today uh, comes down to sexuality. Here's a quote from a judge in Canada. Herein lies the problem relating to the commission of sexual offenses. Having a mature body beyond his intellect, he has urges for sexual gratification, which leads to impulsiveness and unpremeditated behavior without using caution and with risk taking. This is followed by non-comprehension that the behavior was inappropriate. And we sometimes see this in our clients. I mean, certainly there are some, some intellectually disabled folks who are not particularly disabled and they have a pretty good grasp of what's going on. And they certainly do engage in sexual be uh, behaviors that become offensive at times to others and know that, that what they're doing is not probably the world's best choice. But um, you know, certainly there are others who um, don't comprehend on the same level as we do that, that the uh, responses that they're having to their sexual needs um, might not necessarily cause difficulties for others. Let's we'll talk a little bit about dynamic risk assessment. Um, as you know, we've certainly seen lots in the last 15 years or so about um, looking at, you know, static factors and the static 99R and static 2002R or whatever other scale you may have some preference for. Um, these scales have reasonable tenure and we've been, uh, we've been using them to, to anchor our, our risk judgments for a reasonable period of time now. We're just recently starting to shift ourselves to not looking solely at static risk factors, but also looking at some of the dynamic predictors, or as uh, Ruth Mann and her friends call them, kind of psychologically meaningful risk factors. 
when we look at them, though, I mean, the, the dynamic risk variables are very much related to how a person interacts with the world um, and can have a lot to do with lifestyle management, personality preferences or, you know, personality variables, um, and patternized behavior. And uh, given the list that we saw before with some of the difficulties that people with intellectual disabilities face, it's reasonable to expect that many people with ID are going to face some fairly serious challenges in terms of some of the, the sort of day-to-day -day psychologically meaningful activities that we all, again, take somewhat for granted. So, uh, you know, just for instance, something as simple as, as in kind of relationship stability, um, when we're looking at a, at, a, um, at a tool like, say, for instance, the Stable 2007, one of the, the items in there talks about whether or not the client has been able to develop an age-appropriate intimate relationship with someone else and to have that last for a reasonable period of time without problems. Um, given that many of our intellectually disabled clients find themselves in institutional settings or, or you know, uh, perhaps community group homes, um, forming relationships uh, where they could truly uh, meet the intent of an item like a kind of relationship stability that I was just speaking about makes it pretty difficult for them. And then in terms of, of uh, you know, access to other activities in, um, in the community, uh, it's difficult for them to, you know, sort of demonstrate the competencies that we're looking for in terms of, uh, you know, having uh, their, you know, sort of their dynamic risk picture be something that would make us feel a little more comfortable. So in terms of looking at these kinds of risk factors, differential diagnosis, individualized case planning can be kind of difficult and uh, really, I think at times asks us to be somewhat, um, somewhat creative in terms of how we're going to interpret some of these variables. One scale that's starting to gain some favor within the intellectually disabled field is, uh, is a tool called the Armadillo, which is uh, largely the brainchild of uh, Jim Hoven and Doug Bauer. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting way of getting your acronym, I suppose. But, uh, you know, if you go to their website, which I think is armadillo.net, um, they've got a, you know, nice picture of an armadillo there and lots of stuff that you can look at um, that will give you some sense about this. But what I like about the armadillo is that um, it doesn't just look at the client domains. It also looks at the environmental stuff, which I think is so critical and it sort of harkens back to what I just talked about a moment ago because many of our clients find themselves in um, settings where uh, they are in care or where they're, they're getting a lot of, uh, you know, sort of interjection from other people that, you know, people who don't have intellectual disabilities wouldn't necessarily see that because there's so much influence from, from either the place where they're living or the staff who are working with them, that it's also probably pretty important to have a look at that. Um, in that these can can you know exert great uh, great in, great force on on the risk picture or or on the you know sort of protective factor aspect as well. If you find yourself living in a group home that has very poor supervision, then you can see how some of the issues that some clients might have would be exacerbated. Or if you find yourself in a group home that has very uh, very tight uh, very tight constraints on you know, um, interpersonal behavior or in terms of personal sexual behavior, you might see some, some uh, inappropriate sexual problem solving or some other uh, issues that, that might come up simply as a consequence of, of, of clients not having reasonable access, access to sexuality. So, and you know, much like the other, uh, the other dynamic risk scales, we look at you know, sort of stable factors and also acute factors. Um, and I would encourage you to go to the Armadillo website um, with, within the context of what you're talking, what we're talking about here. I don't have really uh, the time to go through all the variables with you, but I find this a useful scale. The other thing I really like about it as well is that uh, each factor comes sort of two-sided. There's the risk element, things that might contribute to problems, and then there's also um, a way of conceptualizing each of the variables as being pot potentially protective. So there's an intention here to also consider that there may be things that are going right in the client's life 
and that we want to make sure that we catch those as well so that we can offset some of the difficulties with some of the things that are not really uh, you know, presenting as much problem. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about treatment and intervention. Of course, being from Canada, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, speak at least very briefly about Andrews and Bonta. Um, most of us in, in uh, the sex offender treatment, risk assessment, management world are probably well familiar with the principles of risk, need, and responsivity. Um, what we don't often recognize is that the r and principles are really part of an overall psychology of criminal conduct. And this is just but one piece. So if you truly want to know the whole story, I would strongly encourage you to have a look at the Andrews and Bonta book. Um, this is the 2000, 2010 version. I think there may be a sixth, sixth edition on the way, but uh, this is a fascinating book. Not, a, not an easy read, but certainly uh, one that's well worth it if you want to have a good grasp of why we do the things we do in our business. From my perspective, uh, all of us, um, I, I'm going to assume everybody who is on this webinar in one way or another is either a clinician or some concerned practitioner, someone who has uh, interface with persons with intellectual dis disabilities and problematic sexual behavior. And, you know, for me, my, my goal in, in my practice has always been to try to help clients develop what I call balanced self-determined lifestyles. Um, I'd love to be able to say that I coined this term myself, but I didn't. I actually uh, steal this from uh, essentially what was the Saskatchewan New Start version of a life skills uh, uh, program started in the 1960s. Um, if you ever have a chance to look at this, it's a, a precursor to good lives, very much a strength-based approach. The idea here, if we unpack this phrase, is that people strive for balance. Yeah, and if you put it into good lives framework, you know, you have your, your sort of basic, uh, basic human needs or goods, things that each of us need to achieve or to attain in order to have some degree of balance in our life. And, you know, sort of practically speaking, when you put too much effort into any one of those domains, um, you do so to, to the detriment of some other area. So we might argue that people who engage in, you know, sexual offending are more concerned about their own needs than the needs of others, um, more self-focused than, than other focused. And this imbalance is what causes them to get into trouble. But it's not just about the balance. It's also about self-determination. Uh, as a species, we, uh, we very much dislike being told what to do. Um, we like to be able to make decisions for ourselves. We like excuse me, we like the freedom to make our own choices and to have some, some reasonable roster of things that we can decide between as we go through our weeks and months and years of our lives. Um, as you can imagine, um, within the sex offending population generally, many of our clients find themselves either incarcerated or under supervision where the concept of self-determination uh, might not be as broad as for a private citizen who's not involved with the system. If we look at the intellectually disabled population, this becomes even more so um, an issue given that uh, many of them have, have a difficult time making decisions for themselves. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, within either the institutional or, you know, group home setting, uh, the opportunities for, for self-determination can be somewhat blunted. So if we want our clients to keep moving forward, the idea is to to um, you know, sort of uh, promote balance, but at the same time, give them increasing opportunities to make decisions for themselves. Um, you know, I, I've found at least that this certainly helps. And of course, the little bit with the asterisk, um, of course, we always have to keep safety in mind. In terms of the sort of behavioral difficulties we see in our adult clients, and I am gonna focus mostly on adults today, but here we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the precursor behavior. So when we look at children with intellectual disabilities, we see a lot of the sorts of things that may become a bit of an issue for us later in life when we're trying to manage um, inappropriate social behavior or perhaps awkward social behavior. So children with ID tend to be impulsive, uninhibited, overly friendly, um, you know, wanting hugs and high fives and fist bumps from, you know, virtually everybody, um, including strangers. They can be intrusive at times. 
They may have some poor social skills. Sometimes they inject themselves into situations just purely because of that you know, sort of inquisitiveness. Um, and sometimes, you know, this can be annoying, I suppose, for some people. For the most part, we wouldn't have much difficulty if, uh, you know, if a Down syndrome child or if some other child with an intellectual disability, you know, kind of in, injected themselves into our moment, we would probably be fairly tolerant of that. As people get older, uh, you know, I'm talking about the clients with ID, as they get older, we become less tolerant of that. In terms of, of how we need to keep these kinds of things in mind when we're building interventions for our clients later on, um, there are a number of different things with respect to treatment that we need to, to consider. Um, there are lots of different treatment packages and we've certainly got well more than our fair share of things that we can rely on. But um, as I said before, we need to be pretty, uh, pretty inventive, pretty creative when taking these, these uh, you know, sort of tried and true methods, some of which may work with, with the intellectually disabled population, some of which may not. Um, because, because communication can be such an issue and many of our clients may indeed be nonverbal, um, we need to reduce our, our reliance on you know, written materials. Uh, if, as much as possible, using, using visual sorts of things or being able to demonstrate in, you know, sort of in vivo um, can really be helpful. One of the things that we've done with some of our clients at the Peel Behavioral Service where, um, you know, where this book and where this webinar, I suppose, in some uh, respects emanates from, um, with some of our clients who have a difficult time comprehending behavior, what we've done is actually to make little mini videos. So we, we get the client to work together with his case manager to sort of script how he would behave in a certain set of circumstances, um, almost, like writing a, almost like writing a screenplay. And then we get out the video camera and using uh, uh, some of the other clients from group perhaps or some of the other staff, we get the client to actually act this out, to follow the script while we videotape it so that we can then show it back to him and he can have a chance to see how he behaved and how he was able to negotiate that circumstance. Uh, and we found this has been really, really helpful in terms of being able to build um, an individual's capacity and really, you know, sort of that, that um, belief in themselves that they can do it. We also know that that practice is important. That um, uh, you know, certainly with respect to sexuality, some education. But depending on the client um, and depending on the circumstances, we do need to make sure that we provide enough supervision and structure that we're we're keeping people safe and keeping people from being put into situations where they may act in a way that puts others at risk for harm. Uh, and I'll just note one thing. I don't have a slide on this, but um, there's some current uh, discussion, I sort of hesitate to call it controversy, but there's some discussion within the field of working with persons with intellectual disabilities, really persons with disabilities in total about rights. Um, you know, the right to have opportunities, the right to have the same opportunities that others who are, who are not disabled have. And for a very, very long time, we didn't necessarily give persons with disabilities the same opportunities in life as others. Um, and I think sometimes that was well-meaning. Sometimes I think we did that more as an overprotectiveness, or perhaps because we had some, uh, you know, disbelief that they were able to manage it. Um, I'm all for giving people opportunities and for for uh, emphasizing the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, I think one of those rights also, however, is is the right to good treatment, the right to good assessment, and the right to good risk management. So sometimes, um, you know, much like in our private lives, there are times when we might need to think outside of the box. And although a certain person may have a right to engage in a certain type of behavior, um, depending on how that behavior might interfere with others, we might consider that, uh, you know, the right to good guidance may supersede. So anyhow, just to go back to this list. There are a number of different areas where we need to look at some modifications for treatment. Um, being, being predictable, being clear, uh, active teaching, 
Um, you know, the, the idea I just talked about with the video, that was a way for, for us to do some very active teaching with that client. Sometimes medication is necessary and this population tends to have more psychiatric needs than, than the uh, non-disabled population. And um, I, I'm a big believer in you know, sort of consequences for behavior, but that the consequences have to be meaningful. Harkening back to the responsivity principle, um, this is, I think, where, where really we need to focus. Um, we certainly have lots of ideas around risk and need, and we can identify those, those uh, needs. Uh, you know, we can identify risk level. Um, we can focus on needs. But really, I think the, the, uh, the real strength of a good program is in how it interfaces with its clients. How do we respond to their needs on an individual basis? How do we make sure that we're actually providing them with something that they can take away. So again, getting back to the idea of, of making sure that things are simple, um, not overly simplified, you know, not to the point of being, being perhaps uh, you know, kind of pejorative, but certainly um, having things be simple, concrete, redundant. Uh, in the bottom there, Joan put this on the slide for me, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, practice makes perfect, right? Um, some of you will know that I'm an amateur musician and uh, you know, at least once a day, I pick up one of my guitars just to keep my fingers limber because I know that I need to practice in order to keep up my skill level. And the same is true for virtually everybody and virtually everything. But it's particularly so for clients who 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 have disabilities that might interfere with their be able to with their their ability to retain certain things. Uh, and of course, culturally relevant, um, keeping in mind that that um, in a way, or, or maybe not in a way, maybe just you know, certainly dead on so, um, intellectual disability can be a culture. So we need to keep in mind that, um, that you know, there are things that come into the room with the client that we aren't necessarily seeing and having a good interface with our client and being able to sit down and be as open and, and as engaging as possible really, will really help. In terms of that managing the, invent, the environmental side of things, um, structure and support are important. Uh, as I said, some of our clients will be in either institutional or group home settings. And uh, you know, certainly that can be helpful. And for some of our higher risk clients, having uh, on-site um, awake staff is certainly helpful. Um, some of our clients will, will require 24-7 supervision. Some will require eyes on supervision. Some will require arm's length supervision, depending on the, the degree to which they can manage themselves, um, either when they're alone, uh, you know, certainly some of our clients risk have risk to, to themselves for self-injurious behavior, but in terms of how they get along with others. Um, some of our clients um, are able, uh, either from the beginning or after some, some time in treatment, are able to, um, to function in either, either assisted living or semi-independent li uh, uh, living environments with uh, some day staff coming for an hour or two here or there. So we focus for the most part here about clients with intellectual disabilities who become offenders, but we shouldn't forget that there's the other side of this as well. Because these clients are so often in care from an early time in their life, they're uh, unfortunately um, very easy to prey on. And the, the, uh, the victimization statistics within the intellectually disabled population are truly alarming. Um, uh, Dave Hingsberger, who's a, uh, certainly a pioneer in our field, uh, has done some research that suggests that greater than 90% of persons with intellectual disabilities who are in either group homes or uh, schools or intellectual, uh, you know, sort of uh, hospital settings, those kinds of places, uh, that 90% or greater of them have been victimized at some point. Um, so I think that we need to really keep in mind that many of the traits that increase the risk for victimizing in this population may also increase their risk to be, to be victimized. And, and you know what I'm referring to there is their their uh, at times diminished capacity to understand the social dynamic and to be able to manage their sexual behavior in a reasonable fashion. One of the other points here is that of course trauma for all of us 
um, tends to blunt us. Um, those people who have who've experienced extreme trauma will have some great difficulties with uh, managing emotions, being able to realistically interact with others on an emotional level. So um, we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at our clients with intellectual disabilities. If they have a personal history of, of um, you know, problems uh, in, 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 in being abused, uh, especially sexual abuse, that that will be um, a factor that needs to be attended to in treatment just as much as the risk they pose to others might need to be. Um, and, you know, certainly isolation is always a big factor in need of, uh, in need of some attention. So let's talk a little bit about healthy sexuality before we wrap up and finish it off. So as I said before, I, I'm a strong believer that people with disabilities should have the same opportunities in life as the rest of us within reason and where that's safe and where that's uh, reasonable to happen. Um, so where possible, they should have options for safe, healthy, loving, consenting relationships that we should support these relationships and we should give them some opportunities to you know, learn how to be appropriately sexual in their lives. For many of our clients, you know, uh, tragically that will be um, mostly uh, you know, sexuality on their own. Uh, getting back to the beginning is, is difficult for many clients in these circumstances to build relationships with others. But um, you know, being able to, to masturbate, to be able to masturbate safely and appropriately, uh, is something that all of our clients have the right to do. When it comes to healthy sexuality education, there's lots of different stuff to talk about, some of which uh, will pertain solely to the client him, himself or herself, um, and then some of it will talk about um, interpersonal things. Um, for our clients, often the, what got them into trouble with respect to sexuality is a failure to distinguish between public and private behavior. Um, sometimes they have great difficulties in terms of understanding, um, you know, sort of age discrimination. And we, we do a lot of testing with our clients when we're doing assessments, trying to figure out how well they can distinguish children from adolescents from adults. Uh, and sometimes there are some great difficulties there. Um, we also need to look at things like STDs and birth control so that if they do find themselves dating or perhaps in a relationship, perhaps even aiming towards marriage, that they understand what, uh, what options there are with respect to, to being healthy about sex. There are, of course, also some challenges. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, find it fascinating always. It's probably one of the things that's kept me in this field so long is that uh, never ceases to amaze me the new and unique ways that people express their sexuality. I can honestly say that in 30 years of doing this, I don't think I've ever had a boring day. So, um, you know, and certainly working with clients with intellectual disabilities, um, you, you know, presents challenges that we don't necessarily see even in some of our other clients. So here's my favorite slide of the show, and you can probably see why. So up in the left-hand corner, of course, we have a butt plug. The bottom right-hand corner, that's called a fleshlight. Uh, of course, Dr. Frankenfurter, for those of you who were uh, like me, cut your teeth in the late 70s, early 80s, you'll remember uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. In the bottom left there, we have some diapers. So why do I show you this? So uh, in the upper left-hand corner, let me tell you a little story. We had a client who, um, who liked to do anal insertions. Um, if it was longer than it was wide, he would put it in his bum uh, and would do so with, uh, with, uh, with alarming frequency. And sometimes the things that he was using to do an anal insertions were really quite dangerous. And on one occasion, he uh, made a seven centimeter laceration in his rectum that required hours of surgery. We, um, we sort of looked at the situation. We had done everything in our power to get him to stop doing this uh, or to try to counsel him away from it, given that uh, it was causing some great difficulties for him and uh, he was doing anal insertions anyway. So, you know, trying to be creative and with a harm reduction sort of mantra in mind, uh, you know, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, it, it may not be the most palatable thing or it may not be the thing that, that most people would come to, but there are actually sex toys created explicitly for this purpose 
they're designed to fit inside someone's uh, backside without causing harm. So we uh, took him to the sex shop and found him an appropriate butt plug. And uh, although I'm not going to say that completely fixed the problem, it certainly diminished the harm on occasion. Um, bottom right hand corner there, the flashlight, we find that some of our clients have a difficult time in masturbating. Um, and those of you who work with folks with intellectual disabilities will know that there are sometimes some physical limitations as well in that some of our clients have a hard time, uh, you know, getting their hand, you know, they don't have the manual dexterity to masturbate in a way that's, that's you know, going to be physically pleasing for them. So th this fleshlight is an interesting thing. It's kind of like, a, it's a fleshlight and um, you know, put a little bit of lube on it. Um, it's easier to hold and it uh, simulates the uh, feelings of you know, having intercourse, I suppose, to a certain degree. We have a number of our clients who are using these. Um, and I should note, uh, before I go too far, we don't just go to the sex shop and hand out anything to anyone. Of course, there are protocols in place and it's been part of treatment before we got to this point. We wanna make sure that we're, we're enhancing someone's sex life without necessarily making it more difficult at the same time. So there's a lot of thought that goes into this. These are actually clinical decisions, not just, you know, sort of spur of the moment, hey, let's let's try to do something creative and uh, sexy for someone. We really do put a lot of thought into this. So anyone who would get a butt plug or a flashlight would have a protocol for that. Um, the, uh, the, it, the, the flashlight side of it, we'd probably have them uh, see uh, Dave Hingsberger's film, Handmade Love, which would also be, uh, be quite useful. In the upper right-hand corner, Dr. Frankenfurter, of course, just like some of our non-disabled clients, um, some in the intellectually disabled population have some issues with respect to gender or have uh, some, some transvestism or some fetishism. And, uh, you know, certainly I'm, I'm supportive of this, you know, to the extent that it doesn't cause anybody any grief, including the client, if he wants to dress up in garters with some nice pearls and, uh, you know, look like Dr. Frankenfurter, um, why should I care? As long as it doesn't become a problem in, in the, the environment where he's living um, and it enhances his sex life, by all means, I'm supportive of that. Leaving the bottom left-hand corner here, I really do have some concerns about diapers with our intellectually disabled clients and that often uh, diapers are a proxy for children. Um, and we find a number of our clients, actually disproportionate number of our clients who use diapers because they smell like babies. Um, and in fact, they like soiled diapers, whether with feces or with urine, more often urine, um, because they like the smell and the idea that this has been used or been touched by a child. Um, some of our autistic clients like the feeling of diapers and they uh, use them for masturbatory purposes. The real uh, key point, I guess, here is that if we offer them, you know, kind of depends, an adult diaper, um, if they're okay with that, then maybe truly it is about the tactile experience. Um, it's about the feel of using, I don't know, whatever a diaper is lined with. Um, all my kids are far too grown for me to know what a diaper is like anymore. And thank God I have grandchildren. Um, but if they, you know, sort of resist and say, well, you know, I really like the small ones, especially where there's been some issue with children, either staring or fantasizing or, you know, kind of watching inappropriate television, um, then we would sort of vote against providing any diapers of, it, of, of this sort because probably they're just fueling some inappropriate fantasy. So there's some thoughts about being creative in, uh, in your sexuality uh, work with clients with intellectual disabilities. Closing thoughts. So pulling it all together, our goal is to increase the individual's quality of life and individualized treatment that we base on the r, &R principles can really help us in that respect. With a heavy focus on the second R, we really do have to work harder at being responsive to our clients, given that they don't learn necessarily or behave necessarily in the same way as our non-disabled clients. So we need to create programs that can adapt to reflect the individual needs of those clients. We need to enhance their opportunities so we want to do a lot of skills development, but we also want to try to, to the extent possible, increase their knowledge, whether it's, you know, that, that kind of intellectual knowledge 
or whether it's you know kind of muscle knowledge. I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but you know, in terms of of you know burning pathways, um, in terms of behavior that uh, you know not necessarily always from an intellectual standpoint, but some of it you know kind of at, at, at a certain level maybe reflexive. We also need to think about motivation. Uh, there's that word responsivity again. And of course, we often see responsivity and motivation uh, together, given that motivation is a key point of making sure that programs are responsive. And I'll leave you with this quote from another judge from Canada, um, which I think sums up some of the difficulties we face. The cognitively challenged are before our courts in unknown numbers. We prosecute them again and again and again. We sentence them again and again and again. We imprison them again and again and again. They commit crimes again and again and again. We wonder why they do not change. The wonder of it all is that we do not change. There's the book again and again, not shameless self-promotion. Uh, all the money for this that, that I would have received goes back into the program for us to develop more and newer and more uh, effective methods to work with our clients. It's my contact details. I didn't say this before, but uh, every workshop, webinar, training session, lecture that I give in, in my career comes with a lifetime guarantee. If you have any questions about this, by all means, we have a question and answer period now, but I'd be more than happy to receive emails. Um, most of what I publish uh, is on my website and you can certainly go there. Thanks a lot, folks. I really enjoyed speaking with you. And uh, I think we have some question and answer time now. Robin, thank you. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the kind of humanistic and thoughtful and, and real way in which you talk about complicated clients. I mean, it's, it's so clear in what you're saying that, you know, one risk is not just a set of numbers on a page that, that we really have to re bring back in careful case formulation and creative uh, interventions for clients who have very complex profiles. And I was also struck when you were talking about the video with the whole question of not of content and what to do, but the methodology. And, you know, I think since I run a special ed school and many of our clients have really significant learning challenges or learning disabilities, and the people who are running a lot of these programs are clinicians who were never trained in methodologies of teaching how much we need to start to integrate the way we're going to deliver information as well as, um, you know, what we're going to deliver. So uh, um, I just want to thank you for for uh, all that you've, you've said. For those of you who haven't typed in questions, um, I'm going through here. Um, let me go back a second. You still can do that. I have a, a couple of questions that um, have already come through. So, Robin, I'm going to ask those of you. Uh, first of all, uh, um, Steve, could somebody I... wrote in that their first two clients were diagnosed. Sorry. Please. Could I interject? Could you uh, turn on your screen sharing so we can see the uh, Q&A slide from you? Uh, screen sharing. Where? Tell me where that is, uh, Greg. I I did make you the presenter, so let me. Uh, I'll take it back and send it to you again. Sorry, folks. We got a little technical glitch. So oh, my slide would just say a discussion of question and answer. So I don't want to. Uh, there we go. So, are we up and running, Greg? Are we doing well? And you can also switch on your webcam if you'd like. Okay. So we'll do that, and then you can see my face as well. Can you see it? Because I can't. From well, he's got a fancy headset. Yeah, I do. I do. But you have a fancy microphone, so. <laughs> anyway, so here's the first question, Robin. It's just somebody wrote in and said that their first two uh, clients were diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia as their primary diagnosis. And I wondered if you could speak about um, schizophrenia as well as intellectual disability and knowing, of course, that sometimes there are both factors. 
Right. Okay. So of course that's that's you know kind of kind of um, the uh, the double whammy, I suppose, in that they've got uh, lots of issues to face. Um, we certainly have clients like that within our within our clinic. We've had a number of clients who have some you know kind of delusional disorders, who are also having some great uh, you know difficulties with with you know sort of uh, hearing voices. Um, at times, hearing voices that tell them to do things that are inappropriately sexual. So, um, you know, certainly, as I said before, psychiatry often plays a big part in this. The, the big difficulty, of course, is that there are so few psychiatrists who are knowledgeable about working with people with sexual behavior issues. Um, tends not to be something that the, the people in psychiatry want to go into, and I'm not sure exactly why. They have lots of clients. But then just the idea of how do these two things interface with one another. So I see the, um, the, the, the sort of psychiatry uh, aspects or the you know, kind of psychiatric disorders as, as being another part of the puzzle when we're trying to build programs that are, that are responsive. So, I mean, clearly they need to go and see the psychiatrist and uh, get you know, kind of appropriately medicated. If that's the case, you may need to, um, you know, to uh, do some modifications to your treatment programming. But um, um, I don't see this as necessarily being um, an issue that we can't overcome. Um, you know, of course, it, it, it depends on the extent to which the individual is, is experiencing symptoms. But um, it's certainly been our experience that once we get the psychiatric issues um, under management, that we can much more easily deal with the sexual side effects that may be coming from that or the, the sexual behavior issues that may be happening, you know, kind of in parallel. Um, that's, a, I suppose, a bit of a rambling answer, but I hope I hit on some of the important bits. So finding a decent psychiatrist who can work well with your clientele um, is a really important thing that I think most clinics need to develop. Thanks, Robin. Um, also, you talk a lot about contextualizing certain uh, elements of client behavior. I have a question here about um, just the community as well, saying that um, most times the community hasn't been well prepared for these clients coming back into the community, whether it be group home or independent living or being around them. And the person sending this in said they're concerned that these clients will be discharged from the hospital and after a short period of time, become incarcerated and they're wondering if you had any suggestions about how to coordinate services with law enforcement, other agencies, et cetera. Yeah, so so this is where the rubber meets the road, of course, in that um, we've, we've uh, you know, over the last century, I suppose, been really good at, at um, institutionalizing people. And of course, in the, in the 50s and 60s through on into the 70s, we had this great deinstitutionalization movement, which I, you know, which I fully support. The problem, however, in in the actual practical aspects of that, is that although we moved people out of institutions, we didn't necessarily follow them with any money to support them once they reach the, you know, the individual community where they were headed, um, such that um, for all intents and purposes, all intents and purposes, prisons have become the new hospitals. And we've seen skyrocketing, uh, you know, sort of populations within within uh, within criminal justice institutions of people with both mental health problems, you know, kind of severe and persistent mental illness, and also intellectual disability and other sorts of things that would you know, kind of limit someone's uh, someone's ability to manage in that so-called normal sense. So when people do do come to the community, um, and you know, this is a funding element. Uh, and it always will be. Uh, I have been very lucky in that the the appeal behavioral service that you know that I've been been consulting with for the last 15 years is part of a larger hospital. They have a budget. They have great staff. They have access to to a, a roster of group homes who are under contract, and they provide treatment both in the home in the community. They're able to go on on excursions with supervision. That's sort of the best case scenario, and I don't pretend like every community is going to be able to have that. But certainly where you're able to advocate for such services, I mean, that's really the safe way to do it. Both safety for the client himself or herself, but also for those who might be impacted 
when the client goes back into the community. And sometimes the impact is something relatively benign. Um, some of our clients like to stare at children. Some of our clients like to stare at others. They don't have the same social skills level. Makes people uncomfortable. Um, you know, being able to have someone with you to say, you know, hey, Joe, don't, don't stare, right? You can look and smile, but then you have to come back to your own stuff. That's, you know, certainly important. Looking at the liaison with other agencies, partnerships are always important. Um, in, in the areas where I've done most of but most of my consulting, we've always sought out the, um, the you know, kind of uh, community liaison officer who works with the, with the local police force. Most of them will have somebody who has some responsibility for uh, interfacing with other agencies, especially around sexual behavior issues. So we, we uh, always try to seek out who that person is and uh, educate them about what we're doing. So that should it happen that we have an incident at one of our group homes where the police do need to be called, as they are arriving, they're understanding what it is that they're going into. This is not, you know, your sort of routine dwelling, that this is a place where people live who, you know, who have issues, who, uh, who will require some different handling. Um, so we've had some great success. Um, you know, we don't advocate for our clients not to be charged if they need to be charged, but we do advocate for them to be uh, sensitively handled, um, you know, and not, not treated perhaps in exactly the same way that someone without a disability would find themselves. So, uh, you know, certainly partnering when it comes to the police, other social service agencies, uh, people who might be in a position to provide either funding or other support, um, always good to know who else in your local neighborhood is doing similar types of things. But um, I, you know, I understand that, that most jurisdictions will be faced by largely financial issues. And um, if you're lucky enough to have these sorts of things, great. If you're not, um, I suppose that means that you'll have to take the bull by the horns and go out there and start building some of those partnerships and, and, and you know, um, opportunities just maybe a little bit Pollyanna-ish, but I don't know what to say otherwise. Great, Robin, I think we have time for one more question. And just so you know, we had close to 500 people attending this webinar oh, throughout, throughout the uh, um, presentation. And, um, uh, you know, I'm sure there are far more questions than I'm able to get to. And so I guess you're open to people contacting you if they want to, correct? Yeah, I am. That, that'd be fine. But here's the last question for you. Um, there's currently a policy that prevents housing mentally ill registered sex offenders in not only the same building, but in the same housing complex or neighborhood. And um, this person said that they'd given um, powers that be a copy of Colorado's research on housing high-risk offenders together, but wondered if you had any other information or suggestions for how to address this whole housing issue. Yeah, this is, a, this is fundamentally a problem of ignorance um, that people don't understand. We've, we've uh, I suppose some of this we have to own ourselves in that we, we, in the early days, we wanted to emphasize that, that our clients did pose some degree of risk because people were overlooking the risk, you know, with respect to sexual behavior. Um, and, you know, kind of pre-1980s, um, we kind of swept a lot of this under the carpet, didn't pay very much attention to it. And then all of a sudden, people started listening to us that, you know, indeed, we did have some clients who were risky. But unfortunately, the pendulum swung completely the other direction. And then we had this sort of perspective that everyone was the worst possible anything. And, you know, that didn't help us at all either. So that's partly what we're dealing with now. We have this, you know, sort of monsterization of all sexual offenders. Um, this is particularly enhanced when we look at, at, you know, kind of people with intellectual disabilities who already have something about them that draws attention to them. So to have someone in that that you know, sort of life space, who also has some issues with respect to sexual behavior, um, you know, the kind of monster picture becomes that much worse. Um, and people who might normally have been somewhat sympathetic um, lose their sympathies. So the, I suppose the 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 big issue here is that we have a lot of 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 
well-intentioned, but poorly considered and poorly, uh, poorly supported, at least by research, policies and practices. Um, and one of these is, is that uh, sexual offenders can't receive certain services like everyone else. Um, some of you who have Second Chance Act grants will know that when the Second Chance Act was first released, um, it was available to all released offenders except sex offenders. And we always seem to do that. You can get this, you can do that, but not if you're a sex offender. We've kind of, uh, you know, backed many of these clients back into a corner. So I, I suppose the best way to do this is through education, to talk to your local politicians, to talk to the people who are making decisions, and to do your very best to emphasize um, an evidence-based approach, one that that uh, you know uses what we've gotten from the science. Um, from my knowledge, I spent uh, 13, 14 years living in, or not living in, working in a, in, in a halfway house that um, had a limit on the number of sex offenders who could be there. It was, uh, I, I don't remember the census for sure, but let's say that, that the, uh, you know, the halfway house would hold 30 people. We could have no more than six of them be sex offenders uh, because people believe that as soon as you put all these sex offenders together, they were going to band together and form a, you know, a roving gang of, of, of you know, sexual deviants who were going to wreak havoc on, on the local neighborhood. What we knew is that the more sexual offenders we had in the house, actually the better the risk profile of the house. That for the most part, they paid attention to what they needed to. They went to group, they did what they needed to do. And you know, when provided with proper supervision and guidance and opportunities to make changes in their lives, most of, of our sex offending clients do that. It's a, a complete and total myth that, um, you know, that all sex offenders are sex offenders all the time. Um, and even the highest risk uh, guys that we see of those, those who go back to the community, um, some recent data from Carl Hansen and his group, if they can manage to develop a balanced self-determined lifestyle that, that gets them out of trouble for you know, between five and 10 years, the chances that they're going to incur any further sexual offense charges um, decreases quite, quite dramatically. So, so I guess, uh, again, don't have a great answer for you other than that, this is another area where we need to talk about partnerships and making sure that you are giving opportunities to your local decision makers um, around good policy, good practices, and um, making sure that sexual offenders have a place to go when they get released. Uh, as we know, social isolation and you know, sort of lifestyle instability are part of, of a dynamic risk, uh, are, are part of an increased dynamic risk uh, profile. So we want to promote stability. We want to promote the opportunity to be in a place safely um, and to be linked to others. Um, and of course, just you know, to add to that, give a very, very quick plug to something like circles of support and, and accountability, which I've been associated with for almost a little more than 20 years now, which seeks to uh, make sure that people of risk have links to others in the community so as to increase their chances of success and to decrease the chance that, that more people will be hurt. Robin, thank you. We're gonna, uh, it's, it's just about four o'clock now and we're gonna tie this up as quickly as I can. Thanks so much. Um, uh, just so you, uh, uh, you know here, we at Neary Press produce a monthly newsletter, Research to Practice in the Field of Adolescent. Work. All of you who sign up for the webinar will now be signed up for the newsletter. You certainly can opt out. We hope you find it uh, useful. Um, and uh, we're always looking for new research to highlight. So if you have ideas, once again, we'd love to take to be involved with all of our audience. Uh, we have posted the PowerPoint already on the website, and we will be posting the recording by next week and send you a certificate of completion if you sign off and um, you know can answer the the evaluation uh, questions that would be great um, if you like this webinar you can take a look at all the previous ones that are also on our website um, I want to just tell you a little bit about the upcoming webinar on November 18th David Prescott will be talking about the basics of motivational interviewing and I think many of you know David's work and this will be another enlightening and uh, you know very interesting uh, webinar. I hope you can join us 
as well. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, um, without whom we could not offer this free to everybody who's out there and, and ask that any of you who have organizations or in a personal capacity to be able to sponsor our workshops, please um, let us know. We're always looking for new sponsors. Thanks to the Center for Clinical and Forensic Services, the ITM Group, James Reynolds, Mass Department of Mental Health, Maple Tree Group Homes, New Hope Treatment Centers, Rancho Arlo Society, the Stevens Treatment Program, Wayne County Juvenile Probation, and Yara Counseling. Um, once again, Robin, thank you. It's a pleasure having you. It's a pleasure working with you. Thank you for all the work that you're doing out there for so many years, your gift to the field. And thank you all for being part of the, the webinar, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye now.